I will now try to explain this in a simple manner. Uh, I made a piece in 2011, beginning of 2011, when I had a, a show at the State Museum in, in Sweden, Moderna Museet. Uh, so the, the first idea was to, to really create a piece that would fit in a museum. That's also why it fits here, I think. Um, it's really a piece designed for a museum because it also plays with the idea what you would expect from a museum. Maybe not particularly an art museum, but more a museum of natural history or just history, for example. Um, and the, the working title I had when I had it in my studio was why I got fired from the museum. Um, because I had this kind of fantasy about someone working at the museum and coming there at night and just rearranging things in the manner that he or she thinks would be a proper way of explaining history from their point of view. Or even like stealing things and taking them to their basement and making their own little museum in a way. Um, and uh, that's how it all started. So I decided to, to start in a very logic manner uh, with the first human being, so to speak, uh, found that we have Lucy. And I also started with Lucy because there's also something specific with her because she has a name which makes us feel that she's more like a person than a Neanderthal, for example. It's always this Lucy, what is Lucy? And then if you know the story about Lucy, it's because when they were actually having the excavation and finding her, it's at the time they were playing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, the song. So that is why she got named Lucy. So for me, all these kind of small stories of history and in general, it's a lot that is making my mind tick and, and start telling stories of my own. Uh, so it's these six sections. Yeah, it's six, like one, two, three, four, five. It's six sections. And it starts in a, then again, a kind of a logical manner. And then the further we go, then maybe another person, uh, not knowing me, but it would be like me starting to like use more the footnotes of history, like the leftovers, things that we don't really know about. And all of a sudden saying like, these might also be a part of history. Uh, so then again, you have the lava lamp and then you have Lucy. We cannot really, in one way, I'm like describing them both as being important steps in history. Uh, and then as you see, it's also filled with details. Uh, and I will try briefly to walk you through a couple of them. Uh, it's partly artifacts from history, but it's also partly artifacts just from my universe. So it's like the Borges novel, Aleph, when there's this guy building a universe in his basement. Of course you can't do that, but you can try. And this is like my attempt to try to define history and my work so far in six meters. And of course, you will lose, because you can't. But it's an honest attempt to try to define history and more just saying like, well, it's everything that's around it that is actually making sound. Like what you will interpret in this is the most important thing. And for example, you have this, which is a Japanese uh, copy of Edison's phonograph, the first, the first ever method to record sound. But my idea here is I based it on a, an urban legend that passed around the world a couple of years ago that with a laser needle that you can actually trace sounds when ceramic urns were being made. You can't, but it's a beautiful idea. That then you would hear the sound of these people doing these urns 3,000 years ago, for example. So it's just saying like, well, wouldn't that be great if we could just read history or even it could be like a recording device that we could record something to the future. Because now we don't really see the, the film because we're still dealing with that one. But that's also like the, the common, uh, that's, that's where everything ends here. It ends with a science fiction film from 1959 called On the Beach. So it's a small clip where a guy is just like we are here now trying to find the key. What is this? What is Mr. Anderson, what is this piece about? And it's the same thing, he's searching for a signal. You realize that he's walking in some kind of a biohazard suit and he's coming to a Morse code device that is sending out the signal and we realize that he's been searching for the source of this signal 
but it's, he's not finding what he wants to find that we can imagine is probably a human being sending out the signal. He's finding a Coca-Cola bottle leaning on this device, just randomly sending out a signal. And in one, in one way you can say that he has this glimpse in his eyes when he realized the big joke of this, that the world is much bigger than he could ever imagine. Like, oh, because it is still a signal and it's still some kind of a symbol for something. It's just that he cannot grasp it. And that is for us, of course, extremely frustrating when we're standing in front of things that we cannot really understand. And of course, that's a trope of art often, that people often ask, but what is this about? You know, why did you do this painting? What is it? And partly, you should never answer that question because it's always become wrong. You know, it's, that is the reason often that the artist did it because he doesn't really know or she doesn't really know either. You know? So for me, there's also a bit of confusion in this piece. It's like, why did I, you know, why? But now the third time I'm showing it, it also starting to make sense. It's the fourth time I'm showing it, it's starting to make sense. And what I also decided to add is, we, it's going to be on the wall later on, it's these two cartels, which is the first one is from the Moderna Museet in, in Sweden. When they describe in Swedish and English, what, what am I doing? What is this piece about? And then it's when Palais de Tokyo is doing the same thing, but they're saying slightly different things. And then I haven't actually gone through the text material from here, but I'm sure that's going to change a bit too. So that is also for me dealing with the idea of the museum also has a part in this. And of course the museum is standing behind something. When I'm saying this and that, the museum is now owner and also the the sender, like the Morse code of this. So let's see, what do we have here? So if we go back and dig into my own universe of this, uh, we have traces of an older piece called the Baghdad Batteries, uh, where I'm going through an old, possibly uh, an urban legend, possibly a conspiracy theory, or possibly a fact where some people claim that 200 BC someone created what was a predecessor of Alessandro Volta's uh, battery, like a galvanic cell. Uh, I proved that this could happen by making 50 of them uh, with vinegar, iron uh, and copper placed inside one of these. And I ran a simple electrical magnet just holding a paper clip in position. Uh, just saying that at least it was possible. I'm not saying that it happened, but it was possible. Because at this time, it was also something that disappeared. The only so-called Baghdad battery was lost in 2003 during the lootings when USA invade, invaded Iraq. And it's now gone. So it will most likely disappear. So I was feeling like, okay, let's just bring this topic up again. So at least it's there. So now when you Google the Baghdad batteries, then you have like rather funky pictures from a crazy guy in Sweden making these Baghdad batteries. So again, it's a part of history. And then two months ago, Stephen Fry, the, the, the actor, comedian from Britain, uh, his crew contacted me because he has a talk show. And they wanted a picture of my Baghdad batteries on the backdrop when they were asking the questions, where can you find the oldest battery in the world? And they've been searching the net for images of the Baghdad battery and find these black and white, not so cool pictures. And then they find this, which is like, mm, this looks good. So all of a sudden, my Baghdad batteries are now a part of like the Baghdad battery culture. And what does that mean? So then it brings back to who is delivering information. In this case, a museum. But if BBC touches this, then it's another kind of credibility. So, so it's also these things I'm playing around with in these cartels, that the more people are talking about it, the more real something gets. OK, I'm already saying too much. But uh, let's just uh, go through a couple of just details. Uh, 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 maybe we can move all the way to the end because that's also where there's... I can also quickly tell you that these ones are fake. It's not real skulls. So these are manufactured by a company called uh, Skulls Unlimited. They're also buying skulls, they say on the internet. We're buying. 
So if you, uh, which is the same with the, the, these Flintstone um, uh, tools. Uh, the only real artifact here is this one, which I found on the bottom of the ocean in Greece. But no one knows that, but now you do. And then we have this balance thing, which for me is also the, the middle of this. It's really the middle, the center piece of the, the entire, where everything is starting to like tip over and lose control. So in this you have like a perfect balance of things, which is then the candlelight, which is then, you could say, blown out at exactly the right moment before everything tips over. And for me, this is also the key in my way of storytelling, because of course you can choose to keep enlightening the world, but sooner or later you have to pay the price. And that is also something that's coming back earlier in a piece. Uh, it's a piece of paper with a text, with a man uh, sitting in a cave, cold and dark, and he kind of realizes that he's going to die. But he has a book and a set of matches. So he starts reading the book by lighting match after match. After a while he realizes that this is not going to last. So he starts making torches of the pages he already read. And in the end, dramatically enough, he's left with one match and one page. So he lights the final match and he starts reading that final page. And then he lights this page on fire, which is like slowly burning while he's reading it. So when he finished the book, he's left in darkness. Which is dramatic, but it's also, for me, the, the key element is, of course, that he has the match and he has the book, or the final page. So what price do you pay to actually take a step forward, to learn something, or to experience something? There's always a price. And that kind of point of no return has been I've been dealing a lot with that in my art. Uh, I've been also dealing a lot with perception, things you think are something, and then they change in front of your eyes. And then you have to decide what do I really, what, what leg do I stand on here? Is it the, the physical impact or is it what we know is real or not real? And you have a slight trickery also in this piece, which is for me, like a homage to what I did, like, okay, that was then, now is now. So it's also a bit of a humble grave to some of my old works here, because I used the lava lamp and this two-way mirror glass before, because if you would see the lava lamp is standing here making a reflection, but then by some kind of trick, there's also being reflections on these sides. So it's just like these reflections are spreading out. So that is also something saying like, well, you can try to walk around this, but you will always see partly yourself or partly other things. It's not only exactly what you see. And then you have the two-faced calf. And if you know your English, you always know that, that someone that is two-faced is basically a liar or someone's trying to trick you. So it's all these like my, it's my humor. I think those things are funny. <laughs> I think it's having a two-faced calf is saying like, well, it might also be that I'm trying to trick you here, that I'm lying. Um, and uh, you have a Magritte piece uh, called La Sortie de l'Ecole, which is also funny, I think, um, which when you put a mirror here becomes like the Rorschach ink plot test, which is basically designed to see if your mind is the way it should be. Uh, and that one, again, coming back with the calf, you see like a split skull. So it's a uh, so it's all these references to popular culture, history, but also topics that I've been dealing with earlier. I've also been dealing with the Rorschach patterns in, in the marble of the Mies van der Rohe pavilion in Barcelona, for example. So it's, so it's, it's also tying together my, my, um, my little universe. Uh, and then in the far back you have Everything is collapsing down to it. It's only me moving back here, but should we, should we all maybe a few move back there? Because otherwise it feels like I'm standing over here <laughs> shouting. It just feels stupid. So, partly also why the, the projector is in the, the pavilion, or in the, sorry, not the pavilion, the, the vitrine, is because it's almost, I wanted this to be an object, but something is leaking out. And what we see here is, of course, what we see there. It's, uh, it's also 
the future in 1959. It's a gloomy and very dystopic future, but it's still it's sci-fi from the 50s. We already passed that, so it's also that we are ahead of the future that we see here. Uh, and there is, for example, a, a quote by William Burroughs where he says, the, uh, maybe you can read it, it says, uh, I thought the main embodied and spirit and soul of the film ran backward, left to run through the Manhattan Project to perform what he equals and to the Exactly. So he, what he says, like, it's all a film run backward. So it all started with the, with the relativity theory, but it ends with the atomic bomb, but he sees it backwards. And he was a master of these things with the cut-up to actually saying, like, well, what came first? And uh, I'm currently working with a project now where uh, I choose a title from Carl Sagan, the also kind of mind-boggling astronomist uh, that died in 96 where he said, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Which is a fantastic way of looking upon the world. It's like you start with talking about an apple pie, and three seconds later, you're demanding that the universe is being reinvented. And it would, could also be a fitting title for this piece, because you start with something that is just plastic, paper, lava lamp, but in the end, it's also that, where do you decide to put yourself in this? So back here we have a myriad of things. We have the text I talked about earlier. We have the, the, the first television sendings from the uh, Berlin Olympiad in 1936, where the megalomania idea to send it straight into space, to have the Third Reich expand endlessly into space. So that is uh, the, the signal that is furthest away from, from the Earth as we know it, uh, which is interesting but disturbing, of course. Uh, and then we have the Baghdad battery, as it was seen when they found it, which is now gone. Uh, we have a comic strip, which I also used in another piece, which also summons things together in this way, because it's also how do you read history? It's these two guys from the Stone Age referring to the sky having the same colors as the Sistine Chapel. Which of course you can't because you're a Stone Age man and the Sistine Chapel is built 30,000 years later. And they kind of realized that in the last square. We're like, what? So, so it's all these myriads of things. Like from this side you have some kind of vibrant um, like a hopeful embodiment of things, while from the, from the side where you're standing, everything is basically ruins. You have even a small bronze ruin that I made. You have the Sphinx. You have, uh, oh, that's a fantastic Swedish painter, by the way, Carl um, uh, Magnus Larsson. Uh, and then you have Julius Caesar. And then this poor fellow who got a bullet in her head. Um, and then the most beautiful title, of course, I've been pointing this out to everyone. You have this uh, petrified tree, the, the stone you see there. And the title for that, which is of course very, just like to put it down, they say like it's called in the petrified wood, a tree. Which I think is also the, the key also for this piece, because what might look like you have to know a lot of things about this. It's not really true, because if you start looking, there's a lot of keys that's binding things together here. If you, for example, would start looking and say, like, okay, this is René Magritte, okay, and René Magritte did this one in 1927. What is this? It's like really fluid and some kind of a hope, something is moving. And then you have another René Magritte piece here from 1950, where everything is just petrified. It even has the French word rêve like an old ruin. So it's like old Magritte saying like, it's over, we, we didn't do it. We had such high hopes for this surrealism, but it didn't really happen and it's over. So at one hand you have like three and a half million years ago with Lucy, but also you can realize the history also moving extremely fast at times. So from 27 to 50, it's an incredible universe in between. What happens in between these years is incredible. So, so that's also something is getting more and more comprised the, 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 the further you go in this.